At E3 2018, Marvelous Entertainment at Nintendo's conference announced a new mecha action game that would be developed for the Nintendo Switch. And that game is Damon X Machina. And it's looking really fucking kick-ass, I can tell you that. Now granted, there have been a couple of mecha games in the past couple of years, such as Titanfall, Mecha Warrior, and so on, but this type of mecha game is a game we haven't seen in quite a while, in that marks the return of the gameplay style that was found in the Armored Core series, with its heavy focus on action and customization of the mechs themselves. In fact, the game's producer is actually someone who's worked on the Armored Core series, mainly Armored Core 4 and 4 Answer. It also features features music from video game composer Junichi Nakatsuru, who has worked on the Soul Calibur series and the Ace Combat franchise beforehand. But we're not here to talk about those two individuals. It's all about this man, Shoji Kawamori. For those not in the know, Shoji Kawamori is a famous mecha designer that has worked on various video games and television series in the past. You might have also seen his name in the opening and ending credits to Devil May Cry 5, as he designed the Devil Breaker weapon as well as all of its variants for Nero in the game. He's a legendary mecha designer, up there with the likes of Kunio Okawara and Yutaka Izabuchi. What the man is best known for are his transforming mecha and how they're able to be practical in the series they are from. In fact, he has a major in design engineering that he took in college, which explains quite a lot about the quality of his designs and how they function. What I aim to do with this video is to give a rundown of the man's career as a mecha designer by highlighting his most notable contributions to the mecha genre. So let's not waste any time. This is Getting to Know Shoji Kawamori. Let's start at the beginning, because that's how it has to be. Kawamori would get a start in mechanical design by doing guest design work for Space Battleship Yamato and Captain Harlock Back when he was a sophomore in college during the 1970s, he would continue to keep doing this with other mecha series such as Tosho Daimos, Gold Lighton, and perhaps probably the most famous one out of the contributions he's done is Diaclone. Diaclone was a series of transforming robot toys that was created by the company known as Takara. The line is perhaps most famous for being the main source of importing for Hasbro that would lead him to create one of the most popular franchises of the 1980s, and of course even today, the Transformers. Now I mention this because there are several sources that have cited that Kaomori was actually one of the main contributors to designing one of the Diaclone mech known as Battle Convoy, who would be converted into everyone's favorite Autobot leader, Optimus Prime. But that isn't what put the man into the limelight, as that would happen shortly after Diaclone came out. In 1982, Kawamori, as well as several other talented individuals, would create a series that would not only help shape his talents as a mecha designer, but also would end up being one of the most important and biggest mecha franchises of all time, and that is Macross. Macross is a series that has spanned over several iterations. It consists of the original Super Dimension Fortress Macross, the film Macross Do You Remember Love, Macross 2 Lovers Again, Macross Plus, Macross 7, Macross 7 Dynamite, Macross Zero, Macross Frontier, and the most recent entry, Macross Delta, as well as several manga series and video games that act as either retellings of one of the various stories, an original story set within the canon, or a celebration of the entire franchise as a whole. Macross would also be adapted into the West as the first part of the television show known as Robotech, where it gained a lot more recognition outside of Japan, but that's a story for another time. But no matter what, all of them focus on interstellar warfare, romance, understanding of one's culture, and of course, transforming jet mecha. There's several mechs in the Macross franchise, like the Destroids, the Proto Devilins, and a bunch of others. But the most iconic one of them all and what define the franchise are the Valkyries. The Valkyries were some of the very first transformable mecha, as well as the most famous example of transforming fighter jet mecha. Every single Valkyrie consists of three different modes. Those are jet mode, Jerwalk, and the Batroid mode. However, they're also rather customizable, being able to wear battle armor, sound booster packs, and so on to enhance their technical prowess. Remember when I mentioned Transformers early on? Well, the VF-1J was actually converted into the Autobot known as Jetfire, though over time, Jetfire has gone through several different design iterations, some of which would actually pay homage to his Valkyrie origins. Kawamori has always been the father of Macross ever since its conception, 
and has usually been very much involved with each iteration of the franchise. The only Macross entry that did not have his involvement was Macross 2 Lovers Again. There have been also other mecha designers that have contributed to the series, such as Koichi Ohada and Kazutaka Miyatake, but Kawamori has done most of the design work that's been present throughout the series. Now there is a lot to say about Macross, as it is the most important series that Kawamori has ever worked on, but we got several other series to talk about throughout the man's career. Now even though Macross is the big one that Kawamori worked on during the 1980s, there are two other mecha pieces that I would like to mention that he worked on during that time period. The first one would be Dangayo. Dangayo was a 1987 Super Robot OVA that was directed by Toshiki Hirano, with additional designs supplied by Koichi Ohada, and was animated by AIC. Dangayo is a mech that was formed up by three different jets that would form the robot itself. What's interesting to know about Dangayo is that while Kawamori came up with the original design, the design itself would be heavily altered by mecha animator Masami Obari. Obari mainly changed the proportions of Dango and also removed some slight design aspects, but the likeness of the mech would still be intact and would still keep the combining jet aspect that Kawamori came up with himself. The OVA got itself a sequel in 2001 called Great Dango, however Masami Obari and Kawamori were not involved with this project. The other piece, what happened in 1989 where Kawamori would provide the main mech design for the 1989 sci-fi action film, Gunhead. The history of Gunhead's production is actually quite interesting. The film was produced by Toho, who are best known for the Godzilla franchise. You see, in 1984, Toho brought back Godzilla after a 10-year hiatus with the film known as Return of Godzilla, or Godzilla 1984. So where does Gunhead fit into this exactly? Well. Gunhead was actually going to be the sequel to The Return of Godzilla. The film's plot would involve Godzilla fighting off an army of robots that were commanded by a super AI. However, the actual follow-up to The Return of Godzilla would be the 1989 film Godzilla vs. Biollante, which led to the robot army script being converted into the film we now know as Gunhead. Gunhead would be Kawamori's first foray into live-action territory, since at that point he was only doing stuff for animation. The Gunhead is primarily a tank-based mecha, but also has an artificial intelligence built inside the mech in order to help out the pilot in combat. It also has a tank form that is used for mobility throughout the battlefield. Besides the film itself, Gunhead would also gain itself a manga adaptation by Kia Asamiya, and a PC Engine game that has nothing to do with the film other than the title. And that pretty much wraps it all up for Kawamori stuff in the 1980s, so let's move on to the next decade. We've now reached the 90s. By this point, Kawamori would continue to further expand upon the Macross saga with Macross Plus and Macross 7, all of which would happen in 1994. However, before this would all happen, Kawamori would contribute to Studio Sunrise on the newest entry of one of the most legendary mecha series of all time, Mobile Suit Gundam. And that project in question would be the 1991 OVA series, Mobile Suit Gundam 0083 Stardust Memory. Stardust Memory itself was an OVA series that would actually take place between the original Mobile Suit Gundam and Zeta Gundam. That would serve to bridge the two series together. The mobile suits that Kawamori would design for would consist of the following. The Gundam GP-01 Zephranthes, its upgrade form the GP-01FB, and lastly, the Gundam GP-02 Physalis. Both the GP-01 and the GP-02 were experimental prototype Gundams that were meant to be used for the Earth Federation. However, a Xeon squad infiltrated the Earth Federation's base that contained these two mobile suits, with the GP-02 being stolen by the Nightmare of Solomon, Anna Elgato. While the GP-01 has a lot of similar aspects to other Gundam suits, such as Vulcans, Beam Sabers, a shield, beam rifles, and so on, the GP-02 is the real deal here. Outside of its appearance, which is noticeably more bulkier than prior Gundam suits that have been shown in the franchise, what really defines the suit is that it carries a nuke launcher. It also has incredibly durable armor, but that isn't to say it's a slow-moving tank. In fact, the thrusters on its shoulders make it overall a very maneuverable mobile suit. Stardust Memory would be quite the success for the franchise, and would show up in various video games, and of course various model kits of the mechs themselves. 
Kyle Moore would contribute to other series by Sunrise during the 90s, and would even wrote the screenplay to one of their shows, The Vision of Escaflone. However, he would not supply the design work in that series, as that would go out to other mecha designers such as Junya Ishigaki and Kimitoshi Yamane. Now listen, the last couple of entries that I've talked about have only just been footnotes in Kawamori's career. And while Macross was still the big money maker for him during the 90s, Kawamori's next big project would happen very shortly in the same decade. In 1997, a game developer by the name of From Software, who at the time was best known for the Kingsfield series, would put out a video game on the PlayStation 1 that would not only be the game that would put them on the map of the industry, but it would also mark the start of one of the most famous mecha game series. And that game was Armored Core. The setting of Armored Core takes place in the post-apocalypse, where humanity itself is struggling to cope with the fact that the rest of the world is completely devastated. What does rule the rest of the world are various corporations that fight each other for various reasons or another, whether it's for money, competition, global domination, and so on. However, because of the various corporations fighting for each other, this offers up various job opportunities for a group of mercenaries who work independently from the corporations, known as the Ravens. And how do Ravens get their job done? By piloting special types of mechs known as Armored Cores. The main draw of Armored Core, you know, besides being able to blow shit up with your mech, is found in its highly extensive customization. You can create a regular human-based AC, one that is basically a tank, a hover-based one that is built around speed, you name it. The possibilities are practically endless when it comes to this. The games would have several Armored Core units that would become very iconic throughout the series' run, with the most famous one being Nineball. Nineball made its first appearance in the very first Armored Core back in 1997, and has gone through several iterations throughout the years. The most advanced one would have to be Nineball Seraph, appearing in the third game in the series, Master of Arena. What makes this iteration of Nineball stand out from the rest is the fact that it's able to transform itself into a jet. Now, Kawamori's involvement throughout the games has been around since the very first one on the PS1, and has worked on most of the games in the series. Kawamori would design each and every single individual AC part, from the first game all the way up to Last Raven. After that, Kawamori would not be the main designer for all the AC parts found in the later games in the series, but the man himself would return to design one particular AC unit that would be a favorite for Armored Core fans. And that Armored Core would be White Glint, from Armored Core for Answer. Armored Core would prove to be a huge success for From Software, and would be the series that would put him on the map in the gaming industry, with Armored Core Verdict Day being the latest game in the series. Kaomori in the 90s would also experiment with other mecha video games such as Omega Boost and Techromancer, but in the gaming world, Armored Core would be the video game series that would practically define Kawamori's legacy in the video game world, and would introduce a whole new generation to his design work throughout the 90s and the 2000s. Now we're on to the 2000s. Kawamori in this decade would be mainly a part of the studio known as Satellite, as a producer and director of several shows. The very first mech anime that the studio worked on would be the newest edition in the Macross franchise, and that was the OVA Macross Zero. This OVA itself is pretty notable because it is the very first Macross show to fully incorporate CGI mechs in its series, and would later continue on throughout the rest of the franchise. Now, of course, at this point, Kaomori would be still working on Macross in this decade, as well as Armored Core, but there are two other important mecha series that came out in this decade as well. This show itself would not only be one that Kaomori would do the mech designs for, but it would also be the first mecha series that Kaomori would create since the original Macross back in 1982. Released in 2005, Genesis of Aquarian was a super robot show 
that takes place in the post-apocalyptic future, where mankind itself is fighting off mysterious beings known as the Shadow Angels, who are hell-bent on wiping out humanity's very existence. The savior for mankind itself comes in the form of the titular Aquarion, that is formed by three jet machines known as Vectors. Aquarion is a combiner mech that you could say was a spiritual successor to Dangao given that Kalamori designed both of them. Other than the combining aspect, Aquarion has its own beast altogether. The big gimmick of Aquarion is that depending on the formation of the Vectors, it can change into three separate forms. Those being Aquarion Solar, Luna, and Mars each of which have their own unique set of weapons and abilities, with the most iconic one being the Infinity Mugen Punch used by Solar Aquarion. Later on in the original show, Genesis of Aquarion would later introduce a mass production variant of the Aquarion itself. Besides them being a lot more easier to produce, the mass production models emphasize a lot more on firepower such as carrying handheld weapons, missile launchers, and so on compared to the regular Aquarion. Genesis of Aquarion would prove to be very successful for Kaomori in Japan, and due to this, the original Aquarion would gain two other series known as Aquarion Evolve and Aquarion Logos. However, Logos would be the very first in the series that Kaomori would not have any involvement with. Now I said earlier that there was another mecha show that Kaomori worked on during the 2000s, and ironically enough, this came out the exact same month as Aquarion did, and that series in particular would be a very highly successful mecha series, not just in Japan, but worldwide altogether. Eureka 7 started airing on April 17th of 2005. The show was animated by Studio Bones, who in terms of mecha stuff was best known for animating Razafon and Mars Daybreak. The show follows Renton Thurston, a kid who aims for adventure to get out of his mundane life. One day, he comes across a mysterious mech known as the Nirvash Type-0 that crashes into his home. He then later finds out that the Nirvash is piloted by a girl called Eureka, who is part of the Gecko State in which they partake in fighting off the United Federation. The mechs in Eureka 7 are referred to as LFOs, and the first thing you may have noticed is that these things use friggin' surfboards. This is largely due to the atmosphere on the planet that causes the LFOs to move like this. Let's get into the specifics of the LFOs, with the main mech of the whole series, the Nirvash. Like most of the LFOs, the Nirvash can ride on a surfboard, but it also has the ability to transform into a car. During the midpoint of the series, the Nirvash itself will get an upgraded form called the Nirvash Mark II that would allow itself to turn itself into a space jet. Now that's the Kaomori we all know for sure. There's a bunch of other LFOs present in Eureka 7, such as the Devilfish and the End. There are even some that are actually direct references to past Kawamori mecha. The most notable ones I find are probably the fact that the monsoons look suspiciously like armored core units, and the spearheads which have the exact same color schemes as the two Valkyries piloted by Max and Melia from the original Macross. Eureka 7, much like Aquarion, would be a huge success for Kawamori's career, and would get itself a movie called Pocketful of Rainbows, which would be an alternate continuity from the show, and the sequel series Eureka 7 Astral Ocean. Kaomori didn't make his return to Astral Ocean, but it was only for the new Near Bash and nothing else. As of now, Eureka 7 has a new series of movies called Eureka 7 High Evolution, which serves as a different continuity from the show, much like Pocket Full of Rainbows does. After Genesis of Aquarion and Eureka 7, Kaomori would create a bunch of other mecha shows while working at Studio Satellite. These would include shows such as Nobunaga the Fool, M3, and Jushinki Pandora, or as it's known in the West as Last Hope for some reason or another. Kaomori would also contribute to various toy lines later on in the 2000s, like LEGO's Exoforce line and Gyro Zetter. That pretty much wraps it up for all the mecha stuff that I want to talk about, but there is one last aspect of Kaomori's design work that I want to highlight. What is it, you may ask? Well, that would be Kaomori's vehicle designs. Now, I mentioned earlier that Kawamori worked on Space Battleship Yamato and Captain Harlock in his early days, but there's actually a lot more to it than just Leiji Matsumoto's space operas. The first thing worth mentioning are spaceship designs for Crusher Joe. 
Crusher Joe itself was a series of novels that would eventually get itself a movie and two OVAs animated by Studio Sunrise. The aircrafts and ships that Kawamori designed were the Crusher Fighters 1 and 2, the Galleon Tank, not to be confused with Galleon from Gal Gygar, and the Minerva. The next vehicle-based one is the sci-fi racing show, Future GPX Cyber Formula. The titular Cyber Formulas are a special type of racing car that have their own unique abilities, like having jet thrusters for speed boosting, or activating satellites for navigation. The main Cyber Formula is referred to as the Osirada. The Osirada stands out from other Cyber Formulas because it has an artificial intelligence built into the vehicle itself, as its function is to help out the driver during the races of the show. Much like Crusher Joe, Cyber Formula was animated by Studio Sunrise, and it would be quite the success for them during the 90s. Even managed to get itself four sequel OVAs all the way up to the year 2000. The last one I want to mention, and yes, this is yet another Sunrise production, so bear with me. With that one being Outlaw Star, with Kawamori designing the titular ship itself. The Outlaw Star is quite unique from other spacecrafts because not only does it have an AI built into it, it also comes equipped with two robot arms in which it is able to carry and use several different types of weapons such as battle axes and firearms. However, this is only just a few of the vehicular designs that Kalamori has worked on, as he would work on other popular series such as Pat Labor, Thunderbirds, the Ace Combat series, and many, many more. Well, that pretty much wraps up Kalamori's design work, as I feel I've covered all that I really needed to. Now, there is one mecha show that Kawamori supposedly worked on that I didn't talk about or really go into, that being Gordian. This is not because of the fact that I didn't want to talk about it. In fact, I would have. It's just that the show doesn't have a lot of information that suggested that Kawamori worked on it, largely due to how obscure the show is. But I'll mention it here just in case. Anyways... I hope you found this video on Kawamori's work informative and maybe you've gained an interest in some of the things he's worked on. I'm a huge fan of Kawamori's design work and that also goes double for some of the things he's worked on, with my favorites being Macross and Armored Core, but I also have a huge soft spot for Gunhead, Eureka 7, and Aquarion as well. I'm definitely looking forward to Damon X Machina when it comes out, even though at the time of this video is released I don't actually have a Switch. That is, until the game gets ported to other platforms as well. With that said, Take care, and have a good one.